So, hey everybody, hope you had a great weekend. I'll be uh, doing the call today. Uh, today's topic is the sale plan, but before we get into that, um, I wanted to give you a little bit of an update on the marketing that we've been doing. Um, we're working on creating marketing that works to get online appointments, and we're using short video, and we'll also be using some other media as well uh, to get in front of people, but I just wanted to let you know how things were going. You know, we said from the beginning, that there were two components to success in any kind of online marketing. And the first thing that had to happen is we had to have people watch something. We wanted to be make sure we had something that people wanted to watch. And then the other part of that, the second part of that was, would they meet with you? So just to give you some numbers, to an update on what's been going on, um, we have a little bit of data to share. Uh, we mailed out 5,000 pieces. Uh, to get people to watch uh, a short video. And so we got 33 unique viewers um, that watched it 89 times and 43 times to the very end. So people are watching the video. They're interested in the message. They're watching the video. And there were five appointments made from it. So that's not calling out or anything. That's just people watching the video and making appointments. And just to give you like a little bit of a frame of reference, uh, I know ECA had been running webinar labs, and some of you have done that, and you know that for the most part, they're mailing out 10,000 pieces and not getting anything like these numbers. So for us to mail out 5,000, get 33 people to watch multiple times all the way to the end and make five appointments, that's that's really, really good. So the first part of that, can we get people to watch a video? The answer is yes. We've kind of I think we've got something that works. As far as the five appointments, the jury's still out on that. We're still waiting to see what those appointments are gonna look and sound like. So when we know something, um, we'll let you know. But I thought the response to the mailing and the video was really good, so we wanted to share that with you. Um, Missy, did you have anything that you wanted to add or does that pretty much sum it up? Um, nope, that that's, they'll increase just a little bit more. That was Those numbers were actually as of uh, last Thursday. I haven't gotten a chance to uh, update them here over the weekend. So um, we expect them to grow. Well, Obviously, these things kind of continue to dribble on for a little bit, but um, we're pretty happy with where we're at at this point. Well, I'm going to jump in there. So, guys, the marketing is fantastic, but what is the marketing worth if we don't close business? Nothing. So that's why we're waiting to see what happens with the appointments. So, um, uh, and obviously we know that process is not a an immediate process. So um, we'll keep you posted as we go on with um, what happens with those appointments. Because uh, uh, if the appointments aren't, if we're getting, the marketing is working and people are watching the video, what are we going to have to? But but the but the appointments aren't working. What are we going to have to do? Then what's broken then? The video is interesting, but the video is not what? Getting people to take action. So that's what we'll have. So we, we, can only, we can only fix one thing at a time. So that's why I apologize. We can't fix this overnight, but we are working diligent. Our whole non-coaching time, Jeff's, mine, Missy, Trisha's, our whole non-coaching time is being spent trying to make this work to get you in front of folks. So, but, so it's not like we're dicking around here, but the, the, unfortunately, with these experiments, does it go at a at a, um, a cheetah's pace or a snail's pace? So we're going as fast as we can, but we can't. Uh, <laughs> it's never our side. We fix things immediately. We send it to where they need to go. And so we're, we are working on it. We're getting close. We're about halfway there, and then we're waiting to see what's going to happen with uh, the appointments, and then if we need to adjust the video, which we've already adjusted the video. Also, we're going to be trying a couple of other media with the same, now that we know that the video works and the message works, we're trying other media as well, which will be cheaper media for you to use. So we are busting our ass trying to make sure we can get you in front of people. So I appreciate your patience as we do that. Yeah, and I guess and one just, thing I will pop in, it, we are coming up on the week of the 4th of July, uh, which does mean that we have to time our our testing, our additional testing kind of around that. So there will be a little bit of a lull in the action as we have to cross over uh, the 4th of July and make sure that we, we can't drop anything the week leading up to the 4th. So it will be um, one of our uh, next tests that we're doing will be dropping right after the 4th of July just to get some additional numbers. So. 
Yeah, and again, not to lose sight of the fact that the first half numbers were really good. So um, we'll let you know what happens. Uh, we'll keep you up to date. Uh, like we talked about, today's topic is the sale plan, but before we get into that, I want to walk you through a conversation that may become worth having with people at some point. So I'm not as good at looking at the questions as Mike is, but, but let me ask you guys a question and see if I can get some answers back. Uh, when the market falls, what do most advisors tell their clients or their prospects they should do? So when you see a, a downturn in the market, what do most advisors tell people they should do? Yeah. So everybody's saying it, stay put, hold, stay the course, right? That's exactly what they say. And if they happen to have a client or a prospect that has a lot of cash, uh, what do they usually recommend they do at a market low? So if you're kind of out of the market, buy. Yeah, exactly, Tom, invest, buy, dollar cost average, exactly. Kind of one of the sayings that you always hear is uh, buy the dip. So the question I want to kind of, look at briefly here is why do most advisors say that? Why do they recommend that you buy the dip? Well, when you think about it, most advisors, if you look at the industry average, they'll tell you that most advisors are in their mid 40s. So let's just for easy math, let's call it 45 years old. So if they're 45 years old, if it's 2020 and they were born 45 years ago, what year were they born? Let's see if you guys are good at math. What year were they born if they're 45 in 2020? Yep, everybody's getting it, 1975. So they were born in 1975, and assuming they graduated high school at age 18, and then they go to four years of college, so they're 22 years old when they complete their education, it's 1997 when they graduate college. Now, when they graduate college, they're not just stepping into senior positions at Raymond James or, uh, Merrill Lynch or or any of those places. They're not starting their own businesses. Most advisors go from being gophers and errand runners when they're first starting out to having their own clients and managing their own accounts by the time they're 30. So that would mean that they're the guys that are in charge 30 years after 1975, which would put them in charge in what year? 1975 plus 30 years is what year? Yep, 2005. So these are the guys in charge in 2005. They're the guys calling the shots. They're the guys with the accounts. They're the guys managing those accounts, which means they lived through 2005, 2006, and 2007, which were all really good years in the market. But they also experienced 2008, which was a really bad year. But the market, in 2008 hit its low in March of 2009 only to rebound into the greatest bull market we've ever seen. So why do you think all these advisors recommend that you buy the dips? If all they've ever seen is that one low, yeah, all they've ever seen is it, it go down and then bounce straight up for the next, I don't know, 11, 12, 13 years, right? So that's all they know. But is that all there is? I mean, we've looked at this chart many times before and we see that, yeah, there are some good markets in there for long periods of time. Those green areas are five, 19, 16, eight plus years. But there are also some zero growth markets in there, those red areas that last a really long time, 9, 16, 17, 11 years. And we don't know what's going to happen going forward. None of us has a crystal ball. Um, but if you had to guess, would you say that we're probably heading into another 10 plus years of, of the green or, or could we possibly be heading into 10 plus years of the red? Yeah, I mean, again, we don't know. But if we're going to guess, we're probably going to guess that it, it may not be another 11 years of, of record setting growth. And this is what would have happened. This is what buying the dips looked like in the year 2000. Remember, 2000, 2001 was the last kind of extended market loss. And if you look, there are some pretty significant bounce backs. I mean, you can see that initially it lost 41% only to bounce back 
by 41%. Now it doesn't get back to ground even because we know that if you lose 41%, you've got to make more than that to get back to ground even. We've talked about that before. But then it goes down only to rebound by 28.5%. And then down only to rebound by 36.5% then down only to rebound 43.8%. So you can really get fooled into thinking it's making a comeback only to experience even more downturns. I mean, the point is that buying the dips in the red in a down or a zero growth market will absolutely ruin you. It absolutely ruins you. So I think this says it all buy the dip they said it would be fun and you have to be really careful because things can go from good to bad in the blink of an eye okay so that's just food for thought let's kind of switch gears now and talk about today's topic which is the sale plan and so many of you are familiar with the sale if you're a little bit newer you might not be as familiar but not to worry we're going to kind of walk through it today just as an overview uh, the sale plan is a way to show people how to take income from their retirement portfolio but what i want to do today is take you into the presentation to show you that it's not just an income plan it's not just that today i want to focus on how you can use the sale as a tool to position all of your fia sales and i know a lot of you already do that, but if you don't do that, I just want to let you know that it is possible to do that and show you how. I want to start by looking at a book called Predictably Irrational. It was written by a man by the name of Dan Ariely, and it came out in 2008. And at the time, Ariely was an MIT professor of behavioral economics at um, I say at the time because he's no longer there. He's a big basketball fan, and he's since moved down to become a professor of behavioral economics at Duke. But he's very much in the industry. And if you've been out to training live any time in the last two years, you've seen his TED Talk. And so the book's really interesting, and I would, I would recommend it to everybody. But I think if I was just going to sum it up in a single sentence, it would be this. It would be that people can't make hard decisions. And I know that's not earth shattering, but he walks through why that's so important to understand that people can't make hard decisions. They're just afraid of making mistakes. And that's something that we as advisors encounter a lot. You know, we'll pitch a product to a client, we'll get them all the way to the solutions meeting, we'll show them options and, and ways that they can improve, and, and they're on board. They're nodding their head, they're in complete agreement, they like everything that we're saying. And yet, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes we get people who just need to think about it, and they freeze. And the reason that happens is because you did, you presented a great option, but it's complicated moving accounts, moving their retirement savings, it's all very complicated and they're afraid to make a mistake. So oftentimes they don't do anything. And if they say anything, if they don't completely ghost us, they just tell us, yeah, let us go home and, and give this some thought. And, and he wrote a whole book on why that happens. And so what I wanna do today is kind of walk you through how the sale, the Smart Asset Income Ladder, takes a hard decision and makes it easy. Because one of the things that we have to do as advisors, a skill that we have to develop and grow in, is making difficult things easy. And that's what the scripts do, help you to walk people to see that difficult things are now easy. But we can also use the sale plan that way in the implementation meeting. The sale gives people a runway, those lights that they're looking for on the left and on the right, that makes it easy to know where to land the plane. And I'll explain that more as we get into the call. And thinking of the sale in that way as a runway is really the key to understanding how you can use the sale plan to make more FIA sales, even to people who don't need income. 
Okay, so we're going to look at how we use the sale plan to make a, a hard decision easy, even for people who don't necessarily need income. So today's kind of overview of the call, I want to start by just showing you how to present the sale plan as a way to position FIA sales as a runway. And then after we look at the presentation, I'm going to talk briefly about the software that's on the website. I know many of you are familiar with it. You use it. Um, but I want to show those of you who are maybe a little bit newer where it is and, and give you an idea of how to use it. And then last, kind of wrap everything up and tie it all together. So I'll start with the presentation, how to position the sale. Then we'll look at the software and then we'll kind of tie everything together. So starting with the presentation, the sale plan is something that you're going to present at the implementation meeting, the solutions meeting, that very last step in the process after you've done a 21-point checklist meeting. So they should be divorced from their existing advisor. And I say should be because we don't always do as great as maybe we could. Uh, but just like any other solutions meeting or or implementation meeting, I'm going to start the first 10 or 15 minutes of that meeting just briefly reviewing the 21-point checklist, getting them back in that mindset, getting them to remember why they wanted to leave their current advisor in the first place. And then I'm going to go ahead and ask the same three questions that we always ask, which are, hey, do you know more now than you did before we started this whole process? And everybody says, oh, yeah, I, I, I know a lot more now. Um, is this where you want to be or do you want to look at making changes? And everybody says, well, no, I mean, we want to look at changes. And then the last question, so where do I fit into all of that? As you go and make changes, um, would you like me involved and in giving you options and finding um, alternatives or was this more of an academic exercise and people say well no I mean it's not an academic exercise we'd like to see what you would recommend so one thing I always ask people at the end of the 21 point checklist is I'm just gonna assume they're not taking income because I want to show you how the sale plan can be used even for people who are not taking income I'll ask people hey one thing we haven't talked about is income now you're not taking income from your portfolio but is there the chance that someday in the future you maybe might take some income and now when you ask it that way is there the chance that maybe sometime in the future you might take some income what do you think everybody says what would you guess a hundred percent of the time yeah they say yeah i mean i maybe might there's always the chance that i could take some income so they've, they've told me that they're going to maybe might possibly at least want the option of taking income in retirement. So as I make the presentation, I've reviewed the 21 point checklist. I asked them the three questions. Is this, uh, you want me hands on as you look at alternatives and explore options or is this more of an academic exercise? And they say, well, no, I mean, we want you to show us what you think we should do, right? So I'm gonna pick it up from there and I say well let's start by talking about income because when I I know you're not taking income now but when we talked you said you know maybe possibly there's the there's the chance that you might take income in the future at least you wanted it to be a, a possibility you wanted it to be an option so let's start by talking about income and we want our income to have some guardrails so I want you to imagine your paycheck when you were working um, did you know how often you were going to get a check or did they just kind of surprise you with it every once in a while? And what does everybody say? No, I, I knew how often I was going to get a check, whether it was once every two weeks or once a month. They know when they're going to get a check. So, yes, exactly. You knew when you were going to get a check. So from that standpoint, it's reliable. And did you pretty much know the amount of the check or was that always kind of a surprise? And everybody says, well, yeah, no, I mean, we, we knew what it was going to be. So from that standpoint, it was predictable. And so paychecks are reliable and predictable. Now, when we're not working, we don't have a paycheck anymore. But 
a lot of people get social security and that's why their social security checks are so important to them when they retire because social security checks are reliable and predictable just like paychecks and that's what allows us to plan and budget and so ideally when we look to take income in retirement we want all of our income to be reliable and predictable like a paycheck that way we can plan and budget around it so with that in mind one way to plan for income in retirement is to invest in a bond ladder now bonds pay a set rate of interest which is important for two reasons first it's reliable you know when to expect an interest payment and second it's predictable you know how much you're going to get so it meets our criteria of reliable and predictable income and we can easily figure out how much we need in bonds. So let's just say, for example, you needed $40,000 per year in income beyond your social security and bonds are paying 4%. Okay, so if, if that was the case, you just divide the $40,000 you need in income by 4% or 0 0.04 and you get a million dollars. So what that formula tells you is that if you invest a million dollars in bonds that pay 4%, you'll receive $40,000 each year in reliable and predictable income. So that's the easy part, right? But now let me ask you, is a million dollars a little or a lot? Now everybody's gonna, yeah, it's a lot. Everybody's saying that's, that's a lot. Now, here's the thing, not everyone needs $40,000 in income. That's just an example. You could cut the investment in half if you only needed half the income, but, but you get the picture. If you have most, if not all of your money in one investment, what's the first drawback that comes to mind? So if you're investing all your money in one thing, what's the first thing that you start to worry about? If you're invested in just one thing, what, what are you worried about? Yeah, every, Nick's got it, everybody's getting it, diversification. You're worried about, yes, if, if I have all my eggs in one basket and anything happens to that basket, um, I'm in a world of hurt. So you're worried about diversification, but there's another problem. Now, the good news about the $40,000 in bond income is that it'll always be $40,000 in income. The bad news about the $40,000 in bond income is that it will always be $40,000 in income. And over the course of the typical retirement, everything becomes more expensive because of what? Yeah, inflation. So a lack of diversification is one problem, but inflation is another. Those are a couple of possible drawbacks to a bond ladder, but there's actually another more serious drawback, and that would be something called interest rate risk. So the easiest way to explain interest rate risk is by thinking of a teeter-totter. So interest rates and bond values move opposite of each other, just like a teeter-totter. When one's down, the other's up and vice versa. So when interest rates go down, just like a teeter-totter, what happens to bond values? It's like a teeter-totter and interest rates go down. What do bond values do? Yeah, they rise, they go up. Now, conversely, when interest rates go up, just like a teeter-totter, bond values will do what? Yep, they'll go down, that's exactly right. Now there's an easy explanation for why that happens and, and just think in terms of supply and demand. Suppose I have a bond paying 2% and everything else, a CD at the bank, for example, is paying 1%. So interest rates are, are down, down from two to one. Which do you want, mine paying two or the CD at the bank paying one? Yeah, everybody wants the one paying two, right? Because it's more. There's more of a demand. So just when interest rates go down, my bond value goes up, just like the teeter-totter. Okay, but now let's say interest rates go from 1% to 3% over the next couple of years. Now, which do you want? The CD paying 3% or my bond paying 2%? Yeah, everybody's getting it. Everybody's gonna want the 3%. The demand for my bond paying 2% has gone down. Nobody wants my bond anymore. So when interest rates go up, bond values go down. You see the teeter-totter. Now, the Federal Reserve 
recently lowered interest rates to zero because of the economic uncertainty of the times. They're trying to kickstart the economy. So if interest rates are at zero, interest rates can only go one direction from there and, and that's up. And that means that bond values are certain to go down over time. And that's why the famous investor and hedge fund manager, Ray Dalio, is on record as saying, you'd be pretty crazy to hold bonds right now. Now, I don't think anybody foresaw the fact that the Federal Reserve was going to lower interest rates to zero. And so no advisor is going to recommend bonds or a bond ladder right now. They're just not going to do it because they understand that that would be suicide. Instead, what most advisors are going to recommend these days is putting your money in a big bucket. Some of it's going to be in stocks, some of it's going to be in bonds, and, and that eliminates the diversification problem. And the idea is that you just withdraw a percentage, like 4 or 5% of the portfolio each year. And sometimes the money you take out will be from interest, uh, sometimes from dividends, and sometimes from capital gains. And as, as long as the markets cooperate, you'll be fine. Now, um, can we always count on the markets cooperating? What do you think? Over the course of a 25 or 30 year retirement, are we always going to have great markets and everybody's getting it? No, not, not necessarily. We can't always count on the markets cooperating, especially over a 25 to 35 year retirement. I mean, those numbers that you see on that chart, there are some big numbers there, but do you see any 25s or 30s? So as we go through retirement, we have to be prepared for both kinds of markets. Now, this is the Dow from 1915 to the present. And the question is, it's easy to see. I mean, are the markets always up? No, I mean, they're up a lot, but they're not always up. But we're always taking withdrawals. And in a period of erratic ups and downs, we won't be able to avoid taking money during downturns. Now, we don't know if we're headed for one of those erratic periods. We could be in for another 10 years or more of, of bull markets. But even in up markets, there are downturns. And if there are no dividends or interest or capital gains because the market is down when you withdraw money, if you still want the money, where does it have to come from? So if the market's down and we don't have any dividends or capital gains or interest and we still need the money, where are we going to have to take it from? Yeah, everybody's getting it. We'd have to take it from principle. But if you start drawing down your principle, what do you start to be afraid of? If you're drawing down your principle, what do you start to worry about? Running out of money. That's exactly right. Um, now, there's a possible solution to this problem. What a good financial advisor would tell you is, well, the market's experiencing a downturn, but it's just temporary. It'll bounce back. It always does. So just don't take withdrawals for the next three to six months so we can kind of ride this out. And then we can start taking money again. Now, what would have happened if when you were working, your employer had said, hey, it's been a little slow lately, but things are going to pick up. They always do. Just don't expect a paycheck for the next three to six months while we ride this out, and then we'll start paying you again. I mean, what kind of pickle would most people be in? I mean, how many people could actually afford to do that? Yeah, I mean, you, you just laugh or, or quit, somebody said. I mean, no one can really afford to do that. So can I show you an alternative that overcomes the drawbacks of the bond ladder and kind of that, that big bucket strategy. Now, this may or may not be something for you to consider, but it's called the Smart Asset Income Ladder, or SALE for short. So here's how it works. Uh, John and Mary are, Smith are an imaginary couple with $500,000, and they need $2,000 a month in retirement to supplement their pension or Social Security. And so this plan is specific to them, but it'll give you an idea of how a sale plan works. Obviously, everyone's numbers will be a little bit different. Um, but John and Mary are going to ladder their portfolio according to the numbers that you see here. So asset number one is going to give them that $2,000 per month they need for the first five years. 
So they're getting reliable and predictable income for how many years? If asset one is for five years, how many years are they getting that reliable and predictable income coming from asset one? Yeah, for five, okay? But at the end of the fifth year, the money in bucket one is gone. Now, sometimes people worry and they say, well, wait, uh, we're spending down our money. But what have we allowed assets two, three, and four to do during those first five years? So while we've been spending bucket one, what's what are two, three, and four been doing? Growing, exactly right. They've been growing. And look what they've grown to. So at the end of five years, uh, you have $513,425 in your account. Now we can use asset number two for our $2,000 per month income for years six through 10. So now we've been getting reliable and predictable income for how many years? If we can use asset two for 10, exactly right. Everybody's getting it. We've been getting reliable and predictable income for 10 years. And during those 10 years, what have we allowed assets three and four to do? What have we allowed three and four to do? Grow, exactly right. We've allowed them to grow. And you can see that they've grown to 563,000 and, and change. We actually have more money than we started with. So if we wanted to, or needed to because of inflation, what could we give ourselves? A raise, exactly right, to offset inflation. So we've, we're, we've got a way of getting reliable, predictable income and still grow our money and even account for inflation. See, the thing about those other two strategies, whether it's the bond ladder, well, maybe not the bond ladder anymore with interest rates at zero or, or the big bucket strategy, they could work. That could work. It's just that they aren't guaranteed to work. What's different about the sale is that it's the only strategy mathematically guaranteed to work. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, okay, what is, though, bucket four, bucket three, bucket two, and bucket one. What exactly are they? What are we investing in? So should we take a look at that? And everybody says, yeah, we, we should take a look at that. But so far, what do you think of this strategy? And what do you like best about it? So that's an open-ended question that they're gonna have to explain to you why they like this plan better than a bond ladder or a big bucket. Now, I showed you a hypothetical sale plan in this mock presentation, but if I was sitting with an actual client, I would show them a real plan with their real numbers. I would, I would skip the hypothetical. So just understand that while I talked about John and Mary Smith, if I was really presenting it, I would be using my actual client's names and actual numbers and showing them a sale plan that would work for them. See, when I use the sale plan this way, it's a tool, it's a runway that gets them to easily distinguish between things that they've looked at or that they would see if they were to shop advisors. If they go to another advisor and talk about income, in the past, he could have recommended a bond ladder for income, but I don't think they're going to run into that anymore, not with interest rates where they're at. But I promise you, they will be shown the big bucket strategy. We all know it as the 4% strategy where you put your money in a big bucket and you let it grow and you just take 4% adjusted for inflation each year. We've all heard that. They've all heard that. And if they haven't already seen it, they're going to be shown that. That's the option that they're going to have to decide between. I have to make the choice easy. And by showing a sale plan this way and actually bringing that up, I'm actually planting a landmine. I'm getting them to see, hey, I've heard of that, or when they go and see it, hey, that's a bad idea. I might have to take a pay cut. See, presenting the sale this way makes it easy to plant that landmine, and it also makes it easy, easy to segue into my solutions, which includes my FIA presentation. Remember, when I ask people, are you wondering what asset four, three, two, and one are? What does everybody say? Are you wondering what we would actually put into bucket four or bucket three or bucket two or bucket one? A hundred percent of the time, what does everybody say? 
what do they say? Yeah, they say, yeah, we're wondering that. Yeah, we want to, of course we want to see that. So they've just invited you in to show them what you would recommend. And you've given them, more importantly, something to compare it to so that the decision is easy. See, a lot of times what we do as advisors, we say, hey, I want to show you my plan and I want to show you all these great things about it. And what happens is people say, you know what? That's a really good plan. And they say out loud in their own words, this, there's a lot of really good things about this. But by making them walk through a comparison, because what they're going to do when they go home, the reason they need to think about it is they say, well, you know, that's, that, that plan Jeff showed me, it's really good. And I can see and I said out loud in my own words why it would work. But that other plan is really good and I could see and say why it would work too. Boy, I don't know. This is a hard decision. And we just said that people can or can't make hard decisions. They can't. And when confronted with a hard decision, nine times out of 10, they just opt for the way things are, the status quo. They just shrug their shoulders and say, well, they're both good. I, I don't know what to do. I should just leave it the way it is. And so if we want to address that head on and offset that, we have to make comparisons, not just to different things inside the presentation, but to things that they actually are doing, things that they've actually been shown. I know that their default plan is the big bucket strategy. Just have a big pile of money that I'll just withdraw a percentage from. And I'll just be careful to stick to that percentage. And I have to get them to say right there in front of me that, you know what, that wouldn't work. I mean, it could if the markets cooperate, but it wouldn't if the markets didn't cooperate. And I don't know if I can count on the markets cooperating. There is another plan that I don't have to rely on the markets cooperating that would work. One that's guaranteed to work in a way that the other isn't. That's what gets them thinking that the decision isn't hard anymore. It's easy. It's deciding between a plan that might work and a plan that will work. And that's a lot easier. And when I'm showing them what I would put into bucket four, I just show them my growth solution. If I'm dual licensed, if I can show them insurance and equities, I show them my equity solution for bucket four. And then using the FIA presentation, I show them what I would recommend for the safe money in bucket three. What the sale plan does is again, takes a hard decision and by making a comparison, makes that hard decision easy. I think you can make the comparison without the sale plan, but I think the sale plan gives you a built-in excuse to make the comparison. It just makes it um, easy and, and very planned out. The comparison just comes naturally. Now, the sale software is on the website. So if you go to the 5Q website, if you're not familiar with where it is already, if you look at that green column that runs down the left-hand side of the, of the page, you can navigate to anything from that green column. And if you just go to the software menu, which is the very last thing at the bottom there and open it up, you'll see there's the sale tab there. If you click on it, it'll take you directly to the software. So when you click on that tab, this is what you're gonna see. The sale plan is going to. Well, ask can I jump you, in there uh, sure, quickly, go Jeff? Ahead. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, just a kind of a, a piggyback onto what you just said about making a, a hard decision easy. And Jerry and Matt can validate this, guys. The the biggest sales we've had. Uh, I guess the, the biggest. Uh, uh, make make sure that I'm using sale and sale. The biggest cases we've worked in the last 15 years since we've used the sale software. Uh, do you think they were just straight FIA? Um, asset management presentations or do you think they utilize the sale? They all utilize, the biggest sales to a T all utilize the sale. Why do you think that's the case? Because are we se selling a product or are we selling a solution at that point? Yeah, strategy, a solution. So it's important that you learn this. Also, 
it's important that you get familiar with this and ease with this because future marketing may be uh, leveraging this a lot more than we have to this point with the marketing. It's always been great to land huge cases, but it's also, it could be a very in, uh, inter, um, integrated into our future marketing too. So make sure you're paying attention to, to what Jeff's saying. Sorry about that, Jeff. Yeah, no problem. And and I would venture a guess that half of those big sales, half the people aren't even taking income right now. They just said, you know, we might. And if we're going to put together a plan where we would have the ability to take income, do I want a plan that's um, might work or a plan that will work? This is the only they're, they're saying in their own words, this is the only plan that will work. So we we have to get out of that mindset that this is only for people that are taking income. It's for everybody that would answer yes to the question, is there the, I know you're not taking income now, but is there the possibility that someday in the future you might want to take income? And whoever would say yes to that question is a candidate for that presentation. Now, when you get to the software, the sales going to ask you, the sales software, the calculator is going to ask you basically for three pieces of information. One thing, it's the name and the age. We know that from the fact find. Okay, the principal amount, what that is, is how much money do they have in their portfolio? Not how much money is going to go into the sale plan. How much money do they have in their portfolio? And where do you find that? Where do you, where do you find the principal amount? Is that an easy thing or a hard? Yeah, they're statements. You, they, or they, tell, they can tell you. Everybody knows how much money they have, and you can verify that with their statements. So where you get that information from is their statements. So that's not a problem to get that. Now, the next thing it's gonna ask you for is their portfolio weighting. How much do they want market sensitive versus principal preservation? And, and where do we find out how much they want in market sensitive versus principal preservation? Yep, so Nick's got it. Let's see if we can get anybody else. How do I know how much they want market sensitive versus versus growth or uh, growth versus safe? Where do I find that out? There's a whole yeah the bell curve in the twenty in the in the twenty one point checklist. We're actually going through asset weighting. I'm going through a whole five six seven minute conversation to get them to tell me what they have and what they ought to have, where they're kind of where they ought to aim for. And getting them to tell me they're out of whack, they're, out, they're either too high in equities or too high in safe, but either way, they're giving me a number on what, they, what the ideal solution would probably look closer to. So I'm not guessing at that number. I'm not guessing at how much money they have. I'm not guessing at how much they want in growth versus safe. I got that number straight out of their mouth at the 21 point checklist when we spent six, seven, eight minutes talking about asset weighting. Okay, and now the last piece of information that they're going to uh, have to give you is how much they want in monthly income. So if they're taking income now, do you think that's a problem? How much do you need in income each month? If they're taking income now, do they know the answer to that question? Yeah, if they're taking income now, they know the answer to how much they need each month. If they're not taking income now, if they're one of those people who I said, hey, I know you're not taking income, but is there the chance that you maybe might take income at some point in the future? They're one of those people that would simply say, yes, I might maybe take income at some point in the future. That's a possibility, yes. But they don't necessarily know when or, or how much. And so I have to do a little bit of um, sleuthing, but I'm not going to do that just in my office with the lights closed and my eyes closed and guess. I'm going to have a conversation with them right then and there. And generally what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll start to have a little bit of a negotiation. So say they had $500,000, I know that I can comfortably take easily 5%. So uh, that's a round number. I, I could take a little bit more. I know I could go up to 5.5, but I always start with 5%, and I know that's $500,000 times 5%. That's 25,000 a year. That's roughly 2,000 a month. That's me doing a calculation in my head. 
Okay, so that's not a conversation that I'm having. I've done a calculation silently with myself in my head very quickly and figured out that I could give them 2,200, 2,000, maybe 2,200 a month. So I'm going to start and say, well, okay, so you're not taking income now. And yes, you said you might take income in the future. So if I could get you another 500 a month, would, would, that, be, um, would that be good? Now I'm starting low. Why do you think I'm starting low? Any ideas why I'm starting low? See if anybody psychology. Uh, some people are saying make it realistic. What's another reason? Always go up. That's exactly right, Tom. I start low because I'm going to anchor their expectations to something low. And I guarantee when I say if I could get you another $500 a month, would that be good? Well, what's everybody going to say to an extra $500 a month? Yeah, I mean, yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. So I've anchored them to $500 a month. Well, if I could get you $1,000 a month, how would that be? Well, I mean, that would be better. That would be, yeah, I mean, that would be great. Well, how about $1,500 a month? Oh, wow. I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we wouldn't spend that. But I mean, yeah, that would be awesome. So if I could come back with the plan, I had half your money in growth, have safe and get you an extra $1,500 a month. Is that the kind of thing that you'd, you'd be looking for? Oh, yeah. I mean, that would be that would be great. So guess what? I'm going to bring them back next time. Exactly what they asked for, a plan that has half their money in growth, half their money in safe that will give them an extra $1,500 a month. That $2,000 a month that I calculation that I did in my head was just what I so I would know what the top end of the negotiation would be. I started low, anchored them to a low number so that by the time I get to 1500, well south of that 2000, 2200 that I could go to, they're already saying, oh, wow, I mean, that would be way more than, I mean, we would never spend that. I mean, that would be, that would definitely be enough. Now, just because I put it into a sale plan, 1500 a month, do I, do they have to take 1500 a month or can they defer? Are they required to take money? No, we can't. No one's going to make them take money. No one's going to tell them, I'm here to drive you to the bank. We are making a $1,500 withdrawal this month, whether you like it or not. That doesn't happen. They don't have to take it. It's just that they have the ability to take it at any time that they want. So I don't want you to think that just because we're putting that number in there that they have to take income. They don't. I just want to show them that it gives them the opportunity to take income. But more importantly, when they understand that, when I start showing them the comparison, they know they don't have to take the income, but it still gives me an excuse to make the comparison. And it's that comparison that makes that hard decision easy, makes them more likely to pull the trigger and make a decision and say, yes, let's go ahead, let's do this thing. So that software, is on the website and that's where those three numbers come from. And if you have those three numbers, you have everything you need to create a plan just like this. Now, this is the plan that comes up on the software. You'll see in the bottom left corner there, there's a little green button that says generate PDF. Just click that button and you'll get something that'll print that's really nice and, and presentable and, and easy to, to talk through. And that's it. You're ready. To present. So everything that I talked about, that presentation, the software, the explanation of how to make the inputs and everything is, is on the website. Again, you can navigate to anything from that green column on the left. The sale presentation is something that you make at the implementation meeting. So if you go to the meeting process, open up that menu and click on implementation meeting, You'll see there's there's a whole tab there called sale program with a couple of links there. Uh, one that explains the software and how to build the plan and one on, on how to um, present it. So you don't have to memorize everything that I just talked about over this call. It's all out um, there for you to listen to as often as you want. And again, remember, 
A sale plan is a way to show people how to take income from their portfolio. And while it's not the only way to take income, it is the only way guaranteed to work. And a lot of times I'll tell people, if you don't believe me, when you go and see another income plan from another advisor, just ask him, is this guaranteed? And see what he says. They'll tell you straight out, no, it's not guaranteed. You know, it should work, but it's not guaranteed. This, I can tell you, is guaranteed. But I also want you to see from this call that a sale plan doesn't just have to be an income plan. It's also a way to position an FIA, even for people who don't need income. And it enables you to give people something to compare your safe money solution to, that big bucket strategy. And that comparison in the sale presentation is a way to make a hard decision easy. And when you can make hard decisions easy, that's how you close more people faster. And one of the things that I, I constantly hear is, you know, it's working. It's just, it's taking a while. It's, it's just dragging out. Using a sale and getting to a place where you can make that comparison is a way to get people to say, you know what, I'm ready now. I, 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 now I know, I, I know how to make the decision. I have all the information. I've seen both side by side. I'm ready to decide. I don't need to, I don't have any more questions. We don't need to have another meeting. I'm ready to go now. So that's, that's all I've got. Um, um, I got a, just something quick add there. P some people are confused on why it's guaranteed, especially column four. Because guys, after you get to column four, what are you going to do again, all over again? Once you've gone through column uh, one, so, two, and three, the cash, the medium, and the medium, what, what are you going to do with asset number four? You're going to redo it. And if you redo it, then are they guaranteed never to run over out of money? Yes. So that's the guarantee and why they're never going to run out of money. Now, here's the thing y'all should also consider. If column four sucks, how much worse of a situation would they have been in if they had most of their money in column four? Yes. Way worse. So does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Why we, I mean, this is a guarantee you're never going to run out of money. It's not guaranteed that you won't have to change your income 10 years from now, but how much more would they've had to change their income if they had not done this and had all their money in column four that sucked? Yeah. And it could so be what? I, yeah, I'm sorry, Jeff. Go ahead. Yeah. So when I say it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed for that 10 years. To be honest with you, you could guarantee the whole thing. I don't have to put money in the market in asset four, but most people want money in the market. So that's where we put it. I, I could guarantee the whole thing, but I don't only because that's not their preference. That's, they're telling me that's what they want to do. They want half their money in the market. So that's. And then where, what assets do you, are they, where does the FI fit into this? So typically, what are you looking at for these one, two, three, four assets? I have a yeah. couple of questions on that. Okay, so tip, here's what I'm typically looking, but you know, I know Jerry and Matt have worked with people on the sale yeah. plan, and so they may make, recommend something else based on what the current interest rates are. And sometimes, I guess my point, this is what I would normally do, and then I'll, I'll qualify it. Uh, normally, yeah. asset three is an FIA. Normally, asset two is an FIA also, unless Jerry says they're running some unbelievable special on a five-year MIGA. Um, asset one is either uh, a SPIA or it's a high yield money market. Um, you could do a SPIA. I'm, I'm, I, I'm totally for SPIAs. The only reason I say high yield money market is sometimes people are a little bit skittish about putting money in a SPIA because the rate of return is so low. And my opinion is, how much money do you guys make on SPIAs? How much money are you going to make on a five-year SPIA? As compared to FIAs and <laughs> asset center management. Yeah, hardly anything. So do you really care if that goes in high yield money market, if you're going to get two FIAs and assets under management? Are you really going to jeopardize a deal to get that little eight-tenths of a percent that you might make on the SPIA? 
versus the five or six percent that you're going to make on the FIAs and the one percent ongoing on the assets under management. So it's up to you. You can use a SPIA. Um, when I said maybe qualify it, the only qualifiers would be Jerry may say, yeah, that's what we would normally do. But hey, can I just tell you, American Equity is running this great deal right now on a product. So uh, we might want to take advantage of that and deviate just a little bit from it. But that's sometimes that's going on. Sometimes it's not. But that's that's normally what I would do. Yeah, and Jerry loves the sale. So when you get to this point, that's Jerry's a person, like Jeff said, this is what we typically do, and Jeff's good at this, but he doesn't keep up on the products because he's helping you close business and move all that money. So when you get to this point, ask Jerry what should go in each one of those assets, and he'd be more than happy to, to walk through that with you. Does that make sense? All right. Well, cool. Then that's Anything all. else, Jeff, or tap nope, it at the top it. of the hour? Yeah, <laughs> okay. we're at the top Thank of the hour. Yeah, just use this, not just for income plans, but but use it with everybody. I mean, that would be my recommendation. So, yep. Uh, okay. Any so questions, it, just it, give it, us a call. Super. Thanks, guys. You guys have a wonderful weekend. We'll talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody.